it's time for us to move on now with our next speaker for today. Creating a high performance team is never easy. It's all about blood, sweat and tears. Well, he has had a distinguished career batting for South Africa before his India innings. Taking us to the top of the test rankings was followed up by that unforgettable victory in the final of the 2011 World Cup. He knows quite a bit about India and how cricket crazy we Indians are. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome on stage Gary Carson. He will engage in a discussion with Ajay Srinivasan, CEO Financial Services, Aditya Birla Group, a serious follower of the game himself. Welcome, sir. So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, for this very special session with a very special guest. As she just mentioned, Gary needs no introduction in Cricket Mad India. But for what it's worth, I'm just going to share a little bit about Gary and the tremendous accomplishments he's had in his career. Uh, Gary has an international career that went from 93 to 2004, both tests and one-day internationals. He played 101 tests and 185 one-day internationals. 7,289 test runs and 6,798 one-day runs with 21 test centuries. A career best of 275 against England, which he got in 14 and a half hours, which also goes down as the second longest innings in the history of cricket. So you can see Gary has a lot of patience. In fact, South Africa has lost only once when Gary got 100. So he has a phenomenal record of scoring when South Africa needed it most from him. Gary was Wisden Cricketer of the Year in 2004. In 2008, I think his most famous twist with India really began. He became coach of the Indian team after Greg Chappell. And we'll talk a little bit about what it was like coming into the team after Greg Chappell. Under him, India became the top-ranked test team and won the World Cup in 2011. When Gary left India, he went to South Africa and in 2011 became coach of the South Africa team. Under Gary's leadership, South Africa team became the number one test side. So you can see Gary has a phenomenal track record, both as a cricketer and as a coach. In addition, he's written a book and now runs a very successful cricket academy. So Gary, we're going to talk about high-performing teams today. And I wanted to start by asking you, you know, having been such a successful cricketer and a coach, what do you think the true characteristics are of a high-performing team? Well, first of all, thank you for the invite back to India. It's, it's great to, to come back. I, I love coming here. Um, um, I love the, the Indian space when it comes to cricket. Um, you don't have to go very far and you, you're going to meet people who are going to want to talk about the game. So um, thanks, for, thanks for the invite. Um, that first question, I think, is quite a challenging one um, in many ways because uh, I think high-performing environments are moving targets. Um, they kind of evolve, in my opinion, certainly what I've experienced in sports. So um, to come up with a, a kind of a, a five-step process to what, a, what the perfect high-performing environment looks like, um, I think would be difficult. I think it's very different in different spaces. Um, working with the Indians compared to the protests was a, was a very different experience. Um, but if you had to put me on the spot and say, what would be one thing that would be Three kind of, uh, <laughs> um, the, the key to it all? Um, uh, I, I would think that, that there has to be a greater purpose other than people's own individual needs. Um, if you can find that purpose as a group of people, I think you can begin the process um, of moving forward. I think maybe secondly is, is to create a, um, a daily language or, or set of behaviors that uh, you all buy into and, and believe in, and to live by those behaviors or that, that language that you introduce um, into the environment. And then the third thing is you probably need to have um, your champions, which for us in a cricket team are your senior players that kind of buy into the vision, buy into the thinking, um, and the way you want to take that space forward. So let's use that framework, Gary, to talk about the South African team. You know, they have a reputation of being chokers. In spite of having such a spectacular bunch of individuals, South Africa has never made it to a final of either the T20 or the World Cup. In 1999, we had that famous you know, one run or four balls, and we had the mad run out that Alan Darwin was involved in. What do you think in that formula that you just talked about is missing in the South African team? 
Well, Jeepers, I think one, one, needs to, one needs to be careful there because I think to win a World Cup, you need a lot of luck, first of all. Um, so if someone had said to me, what, what is the formula that South Africa need to go win a World Cup? Is they, number one, they need some luck on their side, which they certainly haven't had. Um, the question is, are they a high-performing team or not? Um, and if we're just isolating a six-week tournament to um, uh, label them as either a high-performing team or not a high-performing team, I think it's very unfair. Um, they are, they're a high-performing team, and they always, they always have been. Um, what happens in World Cups in that six weeks um, um, is probably something that could be unpacked over, over a long period of time. But I think, you know, top of line, there might be a bit of long-term scarring that sits in that space. Um, you've got these individuals that have changed in, in the teams over the last 10 years. They're not the same guys. Um, that experience of scarring, they experience a bit of mist that sits over the team. That when it comes to that semi-final in the, in the event, something changes. Um, they're not the same people. They don't operate in the same way. Is there a fancy package, that uh, a, a mental package that you could give to the team that would sort all their problems out? Well, no one's found it yet. Um, I think it's going to be a process that unfolds. I think... Um, players that come into the team might not feel that scarring as much of a, as, as some of the other players did. You might have a couple of youngsters who are just uh, great performers in their own right that, that don't feel that, that can turn things around. And I think you're going to need a whole lot of luck along the way too. So if you got the assignment to lead the South African team as a coach to get them to win a World Cup, Gary, is that an assignment would you, you'd be willing to take? Well, I was offered that assignment um, when I left India in 2011, and the first thing I said to them in the interview when I arrived is I don't have the silver bullet to, to uh, South Africa winning a World Cup, as I did when I arrived in India. Um, um, as I as said, I think, I think things happened uh, fortuitously in many ways, uh, the right way. There's a kind of powerful forces that came together. It was almost like the perfect storm. Um, and I think that's what happened to, to India. You've got to remember that... Uh, uh, India won the World Cup in 2011. Um, prior to that, they had been involved, f prior to that, 15 years prior to that, they had been involved in 22 finals across all different series, bilateral tournaments, and of those 22, it only won four. So um, if, if one had to look at that, you can see with a lot of teams, they're not necessarily just going to win these tournaments every time they get a go at it. It's going to be really, really tough. And uh, South Africa have had eight goes at the World Cup since 92. And, uh, you know, it's not to say that they're never going to do it. It could come at some point. It might just take a long time. So, Gary, the, let's go back to 2008. And I think the role of the coach has clearly evolved considerably, especially over the last 15 years. And people say Bob Woolmer was almost a catalyst in terms of the role of a coach in a, in a cricket team. Uh, there's a famous quote where MS Dhoni said, you're the best thing that happened to Indian cricket. And I think you returned the compliment by saying you would go to war with Dhoni any day. So the question I have for you is, what is the role of the coach in a team? What's the role of the captain? And are there areas of, of conflict? And how do you deal with that? And give us some real, real life examples, if you could. Well, I think the, you're right in that the role of, of the coach has changed significantly. We're in a fully professional era of, of cricket now. Um, it's a massive entertainment product. And we've got three formats of the game. Um, so managing a squad of players over a 10-month uh, uh, cricketing calendar is rather challenging, mm -hmm. especially when everyone is only interested in watching the best five players every game that they walk on the field to watch them come perform, and that's what they pay, um, pay the cricketers for. Um, I think what the coach now uh, has to do, he has to look at the year and then build his strategies for that team around the year. Um, we did that with the Indian team, and specifically I can remember doing that with the South African team where we realized that in the, in the two years that I was going to have with the team, to focus on one-day cricket and T20 cricket wasn't a priority. We felt, and I, and I certainly felt, that the team was ready to become the best test team in the world. So we sacrificed a lot of performance out of our one-day and 20-over team, and how did we do that? We rotated our squad significantly over that period. But I made sure that in, the, in, the, in, in selecting the, the test squad, we had our best players fit, fresh, 
and ready. So they actually played very few games in the year. Someone like Dale Stone, who was our kind of number one fast bowler, he ended up only playing um, 30% of the one-day games, but he played every single test match and was rearing to go. So I think uh, coaches need to be very smart in, in, in strategizing around the year. Um, for me, a coach or a manager of an international cricket team, his number one priority is to manage individuals and to manage individuals in a way that they are, 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 their performances are geared towards the performances of the team. That's certainly one thing I experienced when I arrived in India is uh, I'll never forget going down to our first training session and we decided that we were going to have a, a, a warm-up around one of the fields that we were warming up in and only half the team walked out of the change room. And I thought, gee, is that a little bit strange? Is it, I asked one of the guys, where are the rest of the players? No, they warm up on their own. And I said, well, that changes today. Um, you know, we don't have a group of individuals doing what they want to do. Um, we're playing for a bigger purpose and a bigger cause. So I think if that... I certainly, it's the thing that I'm most passionate about in, in leadership is to, is to genuinely get people to shift behaviors for a bigger purpose. And I think that's what we were able to do um, with the Indians a little bit is to see that um, the badge was more important than their own individual um, well-being. So that management of those individuals into that bigger cause, and it, it took time took a lot of time to win people over. But I think once you've got that critical mass up, um, you then have a team. And then once that team is set up, they'll walk through walls for you as, as their leader because they know that, you, that your interest is for their betterment. It's not only about receiving a reflected glory. It's actually you want this team to be the best that they can be because there was so much talent in the team. So, Gary, I wanted to talk about Dhoni, and I wanted to really probe you. You ducked that ball about uh, any conflicts with Dhoni and how you dealt with it. I don't, I don't think we had uh, um, any conflict in three years. Why? Because um, I think we complemented each other's leadership styles. I think we also knew where our responsibilities lay. Um, you know, people often said, oh, Dhoni made the decision in the final to go up the order. Well, we didn't operate like that as a team. We were a very collaborative environment. We had, um, we had a group of decision makers at the top four or five of us, especially during that World Cup, who were instrumental in helping us make the best decisions that we could make. So that decision would have been a collaborative one, not an individual one. And um, I think Dhoni's role as a, as a captain of the team was largely around what he did on the field and the decisions that he made on the field, um, backed up by that senior player group who um, shared their views prior to match time. And, and then once those views were debated, we then went out which what we, what we thought was best practice at, at that point in time. My role in helping MS in that space was to to take the information that I receive from a lot of the senior players and some of the, the new players that have come into the team and to, sh to give that information to him and for him to help him in, in match time. I think on the reverse side, uh, my responsibility to the team was everything that we did off the field um, and in preparation for games leading into match time, what we did with, uh, with our travel time, what we did with our time off, and uh, I think when you've got a good relationship between captain and coach, you realize where your responsibilities lie and then help each other in that space. There were many times where uh, MS would come up to him and he felt that the team was not ready for this session and it would be a good decision not to have it and I, and I would buy into it because we trusted each other within that relationship. But I think the one thing that really kind of stood out for me, a fantastic story, that really won me over in terms of the fact that I meant something in the leadership space to him was we had a day plan to go um, to the Indian Air Force in Bangalore. And uh, it was a day to spend time with them and just to get to understand how they work in a high-performing environment. And everyone was really looking forward to the day. And at the 11th hour, um, um, I was told that I wouldn't be allowed to go uh, to the base as a foreigner, uh, myself and, and Paddy Upton, who were the two, two foreigners within the greater squad, because our, we were foreigners and there were some, some issues with our passports. It was literally at the 11th hour, and I said to Emmett, don't worry, you just guys go with the team, go and enjoy the experience. 
Um, five minutes later, I look and the bus hasn't left yet. Uh, half an hour, I look again and the bus still hasn't left. And I go down to MS. I said, what's going on? He says, we're not going. He says, we won't go to that Air Force base unless you and Paddy can join us. That moment on, I realized we were kind of a real team and we were only going to move together in, as, as, as a unit. So, so uh, Gary, I think you've often said that uh, you like your team to focus on its strengths, not to really worry about what the opposition is about, and definitely not to worry about your own weaknesses. So can you give us an example of how you did this with the Indian team? How did you get them to focus on their strengths? What did you think they were? And how did you get the players to deal with failure when they couldn't get their strengths working for them? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I, when, when I say we focus on our strengths, it's not to say we don't identify the things we're not doing well at. I think uh, we didn't want to spend too much time focusing on the things we weren't doing well at. So we debriefed every single game that we played. And the debrief never took place straight after the match because I knew it was a very emotional space and a very dangerous space when everyone's too emotional. We'd generally take a day or two off and then come back and say, what worked really well in the last game we played, even if it was a bad game? And what are the learnings that we could take going forward to make us a better team next time out? And um, I often found they were very um, constructive sessions because, as I said, the emotion was taken out of it. But I love the fact that we would highlight the things that we did really well. And when I say that, it was the things that made us a good cricket team. And often I think when organizations or groups of people debrief, they say, let's look at the things we didn't do well and make them better. That's kind of the first uh, default you move to, and, and we, we kind of turned that around, and I felt that we had very motivating conversations, because those things that we were good at, we wanted to become better at. Mm. We wanted to make sure if we were better than good at those things, we would take our performances to the next level. And then we wanted to become very competent at the things we weren't good at. If there were areas that we really needed to improve, like um, our fielding, we harped on our fielding a lot about how could we become a better fielding unit. Um, and uh, we realized that there were things that we could do to improve that, even though it wasn't necessarily a strength of ours. And we did speak about them on a, on a regular basis. But we also spoke predominantly around the things that we were good at, and that was we were a great uh, finishing team, for example. Um, and we knew how to finish games, and we used to talk it up and highlight it every single um, time we got together. Even when we lost games, how we got close to a game, but we, we didn't pull it through. And I think that way it encouraged an environment of taking chances and taking on some risk. And that's the one thing I loved working with the Indian team is that they were risk takers. Whereas us as South African teams were a little bit more risk averse. We like structure. We like to work to a process. And if it didn't work, we didn't have another plan. Yet I loved the fact that we would take, when I was with the Indian team, we would take chances, even if it meant us losing games. And it, it fostered an environment of then being able to win games out of nowhere. And uh, certainly guys like MS Dhoni, Yuvraj Singh, Suresh Rana, those guys who batted in the middle order um, were great advocates of that. And, you know, we made some mistakes along the way, but we won a lot of games because of it. So, Gary, a question for you based on what we heard Daniel Pink talk about motivation earlier. How do you get the best out of individuals in a game like cricket where these guys have got more money than they know what to do with, and fame of an unbelievable order. How do you get them to be motivated to go out and play that game and give their best every day? I think we've spoken about it, and everyone has, uh, since, certainly since I've been here this afternoon, and that is create a bigger purpose. It's quite simple. Um, if, if, if there's more to play for other than their own individual performances, and genuinely more to play for, um, people will go out there motivated. You've got to create that purpose, though. And um, our purpose was quite simply we felt we had in the room enough talent and skill to become the best cricket team in the world in all formats. And we never quite got it right. Um, we got close. Um, I wanted us to become a better T20 unit than when we were, but we were, we were not very good at that. But certainly in 50 over in cr cricket and, and, and 20 over cricket, we had the, the right makeup of individual in that team to become the best. In fact, when I was playing against India, I was blown away that this team, with all the resource they have in this country, was not the best cricket team in the world, and consistently so. And um, there's nothing more than excites me now watching under Virat Kohli what this Indian team are doing because 
that's in many ways where they belong. Um, and uh, their performances have now become consistent, um, and they've got a great team. And I think uh, at that point in time, we had this group of senior players um, prime for greatness um, in terms of what they could, op- what they could achieve as a, as a team, yet not quite fulfilling the promise. And I think we created that bigger purpose as a group of people. Um, we decided that uh, we needed to understand what that was going to be. And then once that purpose was created, then started to build the behaviors on a daily basis to live, uh, live that out and, and, and reach those goals. So let's rewind to 2011, Gary. And I just wanted to ask you, what do you think was the defining moment of that entire World Cup? Was it Dhoni pushing himself up the order and backing himself to get us the World Cup? Or was there something else in one of the earlier games? You know, Mohali was a great game against Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, what, what, was, what was the most defining moment of the World Cup for you? I think the most defining moment for me was the quarterfinal against Australia um, when we had to make a 50-50 decision on playing Yusuf Patan or Suresh Rana. And Suresh had only played one game the whole World Cup. And uh, we, were, we were at odds as to who to pick in that game. Um, and in the end, we went on, a, on an instinctive gut feel decision to play Suresh Rana on the back of having not played much cricket with very little form and we made the decision to pick him and he, ma- he ended up going out to bat at 180 for five needing 100 still to win and me sitting next to Eric Simons who was the bowling coach at that point and, I'm, and telling him that I think this was my last day with the Indian team <laughs> and um, Suresh Rana putting on 100 runs with Yuvraj Singh and turning that game around absolutely defining for us because that was probably um, at that point, at that juncture, when we started to play the kind of cricket Mm. I knew we could play. And we were already five weeks into the tournament, uh, not playing as well as we could have played. Mm. I think the other defining moment in in that was before the World Cup started, when we made the decision, also a very much a 50-50 decision, to pick Yuvraj Singh in the the squad. Um, He was out of form at that point in time, and it was really just very much a 50-50 call. Um, But we had done um, our homework in terms of his preparation for that tournament. We knew that he was pumped to play in that World Cup, even on the back of very little form. And um, we had done a lot of work uh, through the help of Paddy Upton prior to that and making sure that he got himself ready for that tournament. We picked him. He ended up being man of the World Cup. So, uh, Gary, after you quit uh, as coach of India, India lost a couple of series. After South Africa, after you quit your role in South Africa, South Africa lost a couple of series. So was this just good timing on your part, or do you think you left a void that the team kind of found difficult to fill? Great timing. It was, <laughs> it was great timing, and a lot of luck along, along the way. Um, you know, to answer that, I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I, I've, uh, I've had great success um, as, a, as a young coach. I've only been in the coaching game for 12 years, 13 years. Um, I've also had failure. Um, in fact, my last, my last uh, coaching job, I've been, I was fired by the Delhi Daredevils after <laughs> the back of two very poor years. I think I've learned a, a, a much more about my own coaching style and my coaching ways through the failure than I have through the success. Um, it was Lionel Richie who made the statement that success is lethal. And someone's already spoken a little bit about that earlier today. Uh, I, I certainly agree with that. Success can trip you up in a big way. And I think failure really gets you back to the drawing board and kind of begins the process of what I need to do more to become better at, at, at what, I've, what I've done. So I think I'm a long way from... Um, kind of reaching the pinnacle of coaching. I, I, I love coaching, and in many ways, I'm out of the coaching space, and I'm a little bit in the entrepreneurial space at the moment. That's why the last panel was listening with my ears uh, wide open. Um, you should picking, get the private equity guys' numbers <laughs> from ready, yeah. Picking up some tips, because I'm certainly not an entrepreneur, but I'm a cricket coach, but, and, and really do enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I think the next chapter for me could, could go in a lot of different directions, but I think the one thing that I've taken from the experiences that I've had to date is that there's no guarantee to results. And um, as long as that journey that you're on is about taking as much learning as you can every day and giving it your best shot every day, because I want to be successful. Wherever I go, I want to do well. 
um, but take the learning and remain humble as the previous panel, two panels before, sorry, one panel before the last panel, the CEOs, it was great listening to them. What I got out of that is just cheap as how humble these people are. And they accept the adversity that comes, uh, comes their way and, and then they, and they build, build on that and become better people and create better organizations because of it. That's my learning. So two questions before I open to the house, uh, Gary. First question is on Virat Kohli. You referred to him. He was a member of the team in the World Cup 2011, now leading India, all formats. How do you compare and contrast his leadership style to MSD's? It's very, very different. Um, <laughs> um, MS Dhoni is one of the most impressive people I had the privilege of working with for three years, as was Graham Smith, who I worked with for two years, one of the most successful leaders in, 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 in our sport. Um, Virat, very different. I think the one thing for me that stands out for Virat is just this incredible belief in his own ability. Um, there are not many people out there like that, uh, in my opinion. Um, but he has this belief that he can change the world, that he can do things that no one else has done on a cricket field before, and he's proving it and he's doing it. And uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, to, to have someone leading that space or to... To, to be a follower of that, of that energy, um, I, th I think can increase your own level of performance. I'll never forget playing a lot of cricket with a guy by the name of John T. Rhodes, who was the best fielder in the world in the 90s by a distance. The way he fielded, fielded made us all good fielders, made us all want to be better fielders. And I think Virat's doing that with the Indian team at the moment. So do you think he's going to break all batting records that so far Sachin Tendulkar Hasn't he done it already? No, he's slightly behind Sachin, but he's going to get there pretty soon. Oh, without a doubt. Uh, he's the most exciting batsman in the world to watch. I love watching him bat. I will uh, stop everything I do if I've got, if I've got an hour. Yeah. And it's a crazy thing about the game. Someone made the point about the millennials. I don't think they have an hour to watch cricket these days. But uh, <laughs> if, if, I, if I've got an hour because I've got three young kids under the age of 12, and I don't, know if I norm I don't often find an hour in the day, but if I, if I have an Virat Kohli's batting, I'll watch it. The beautiful thing about IPL is that in South Africa, IPL is viewed between 5.30 and 8.30, which is perfect timing yeah. <laughs> because my kids are home, I'm home. Um, bearing in mind, you guys operate a lot later in India than we do, so 5.30, we kind of getting ready to have dinner and I'm normally in bed by 9 o'clock, but it's perfect timing because we're all at home, we're doing homework with the kids, we're having supper and TV's on, watching a wow. bit of IPL. And my kids love it. We love it. So if we've got an hour, we'll enjoy watching Virat Kali bat, that's for sure. So last question from me, Gary. We have a bunch of you know, great CEOs in the audience. A word of advice from you to, to them. How do you go about building high-performance teams? Well, I was hoping they would tell me that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I just think the privileges I've had in, in leading, um, I'm a reluctant leader in many ways. Um, I wasn't as a, as a player. And the privilege that I've had is I get very excited about understanding high-performing environments, what makes people tick. And um, I love uh, being involved in creating environments that gives everyone a best chance of being the best that they can be. I also understand that not every environment works for each individual. Mm -hmm. And great leaders, I think, understand that. And they set up environment that, that uh, gives that person the best chance of him being successful. And... Uh, uh, I've had experiences of guys come to me, knock on, on my hotel door and say, I think you're messing this up. It's not working for me. Mm. And, and they're right. It might not necessarily working for them. And it's probably time that either you should leave or I should leave and move on to a place where there is an environment that works for him. But great leaders, I think, get that critical mass up. A lot of people have great success in their own personal capacities because of that environment that that leader set up.